here with Kirsten Manger, founder of Web Visible. Kirsten, what is Web Visible? Web Visible is a software and services company that specializes in internet advertising and customer acquisition, specifically for small businesses around the world. So think, you know, uh, Joe the Plumber, as we know so well, or Betty the Beauty Salon, or you know, Darren the Limousine uh, uh, Company owner. Uh, we have helped for the last decade uh, those small businesses around the world find a means in which to become quote unquote visible online as they transition off of their traditional media uh, mm -hmm. addictions if you will they have been advertising for a hundred years in yellow pages and newspaper and uh, most of them just don't have a clue frankly as to how to get online promote themselves online and reach individuals searching for their products and services online so we bridge that delta um, and we do so in in two different ways one is a simple software and services solution by licensing the technology to large-scale companies around the world that have existing sales forces that call on small businesses every day. So think AT&T Yellow Pages or British Telecom Yellow Pages or New York Times Company uh, or Earthlink uh, in a hosting company. But we also have our own direct sales force, and the reason being is that we have a pretty good-sized addressable market with 45 million small businesses around the world. So there's an awful lot of white space area where our partners don't cover, and we intend to make sure that we can cover everyone we can. Convincing small businesses to change the media uh, direction that they've taken for hundreds of years, as you said, is tough. How, what was it like in the early days, and how did you do it? Well, I think that in the early days, our thought process was because it is a rather insurmountable task. Mm -hmm. First of all, just to reach 45 million businesses is difficult. But you called it. It's difficult in the sense that there's an educational process. So it sometimes puts more emphasis on the services rather than the software. And face it, technology doesn't sell to Joe the plumber. He needs a solution. And his simple uh, and proverbial line is, I just need this to work. Uh, there's no such thing as marketing budgets, if you will, in the small business community. It's, I think I can afford $250 a month right now. So as a result, we decided that by leveraging those existing companies and licensing our technology and solutions to large-scale partners, that they had a better chance of that educational process by virtue of a hundred-year relationship. So Yellow Pages have been around since the late 1800s. To parlay off of that existing uh, relationship was really the most prudent path. Not to mention the fact that there's an extraordinary amount of distrust in the small business community. I'm getting so many phone calls from so many folks. If you're not my phone company, if you're not my hosting provider, if you're not somebody I rely upon every single day, mm. then you're just another solicitor. Flash forward now, we've found that the brand becomes relatively immaterial. Most people haven't heard of Web Visible across the world, but they do know that they need to get online. And they know that we have quantifiable data that shows the results that they're getting in their business. So we've been able to kind of shift the methodology, educate and quote unquote sell at the same time. I see, and now I understand why you'd want to partner with other companies who are Absolutely. doing business with your customer. Especially unionized sales forces in the telephone company because they have to sell. Ah, uh, see. Good. <laughs> hey, so one of the big milestones for entrepreneurs is hitting that first million dollars in sales. Do you remember that day? What was it like when you saw you hit a million in sales? It was um, an extraordinary day. I always laugh and think, uh, for those of us working in the virtual world, we don't have that one dollar bill framed behind the counter. Mm -hmm. So you uh, you take that very first check you get and you frame that. Uh, when we hit our first million, it took us about um, probably two years, I think, in total uh, to hit that milestone. And uh, we had a big celebration. We were still only about 10 people at that point. Um, so we were very impressed with ourselves, frankly, that we were able to reach that milestone uh, with a very lean organization, essentially a virtual organization, and uh, the ability to have found a solution that served so many. What's it like to be a female entrepreneur in tech? Well, there's not a lot of us. Um, it seems to have been a, a rather male-dominated um, um, environment. Uh, most of us who are women entrepreneurs, period, uh, don't like the distinction of saying female entrepreneur or female in tech. Mm -hmm. uh, we would very clearly want to be gauged and judged against our, our male counterparts and 
you know, create a, a very uh, homogenized gene pool in which to choose from. But I think ultimately, uh, the bottom line is that, uh, especially, and perhaps it's age and maturity that I'm getting older, that uh, let's celebrate that. Uh, I feel a, a certain responsibility now because technology breeds from youth. Mm -hmm. And so if I look to the people who are working for me, on average, they're sitting in that 25 to 34 demographic. I feel it's my responsibility now to celebrate being a female in technology. There's not a lot of women who are seeking um, math and engineering uh, initiatives. In fact, the numbers are dismal uh, for women in, in mathematics. Um, uh, as a result, I'm now finding that I've got a louder voice because I am a woman in technology and that perhaps you can mentor and sponsor other women to take this path. I'm not by virtue uh, an engineer. I'm a, a marketing person at the end of the day. Technology is something I've taught myself over the years, is certainly when it comes to um, uh, product development. One of the challenges that entrepreneurs have is separating themselves from the businesses that they created and allowing other people to take leadership roles and grow the company. How have you done that? Well, I'm uh, um, an incessant reader. Mm -hmm. And I've read just about every case study known to mankind and thank God for Harvard Business Reviews and all the things that they've taught us over the years. And one of the things I found very consistent even in the early stages of the business were the war stories that we've all heard, we've witnessed ourselves and most certainly read of, uh, of entrepreneurs and founders who were unable to let go who were unable to pass the reins on to uh, uh, leadership within their companies or uh, couldn't hire correctly. You know, hiring instead of to their weaknesses, hiring somebody who was going to be clearly subordinate. I've not believed in such things. I've always believed in hiring people smarter than myself. I insist upon being the least educated person in a room most times. And I've had to work very carefully within my own psyche to relinquish control on different key benchmarking initiatives within uh, the company's history. So uh, I've recently given up the day-to-day -day operations of my company, and I went to my board of directors uh, over a year ago and said, I, A, will look for my replacement every day, and B, it's unrealistic to retain uh, creativity, frankly, and continually provide shareholder value after a decade. So I think uh, for those of us who have been serial entrepreneurs, there's a natural migration to move on to the next project. But with careful planning, you bring the right people on, you involve your uh, 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 predominant investors, you plan correctly, and you emotionally start to let go as you see productivity occurring in the staff you've brought on. Um, for me, it was a relatively uh, seamless transition from a business perspective. I think the thing that we discount is the emotional aspect and your emotional turpitude. Um, it's hard to let go of what would otherwise be known as yet another one of your children, mm -hmm. right? Interesting that you learn, we do learn from case studies of people who've had setbacks as much as we get inspired and learn from the successes of other absolutely. companies. Have you had a setback that's taught you something that you can share with us today? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, I think this is again the trite term of don't put all your eggs in a basket. Um, we ended up growing so quickly in about the, probably in about the third year of our existence, to a point where uh, we were probably going to be in a position to not be able to serve our customer base well. And that's what helped uh, facilitate our seeking our A round um, from uh, venture capital. Um, we had one customer who uh, ended up growing uh, four times as fast as our model had uh, provided and in spite of the fact that our business development activities were in a flurry to make sure that we didn't have this one predominant customer, this customer became 65 percent of our revenue stream mm -hmm. and then once they saw the success of the program and the products that we had given them decided, hmm, we could bring that in-house and increase our margins. We've all heard the stories and so literally uh, in an overnight situation we were faced with losing 65 percent of our revenue. Um, given uh, the scenario, we just bolstered ourselves up, uh, got back on planes, trains, and automobiles, went out there and created a better and stronger pipeline. Um, but we were very proud that we didn't have to raise more capital, that we were able to recover, and we ended up growing the business uh, twofold again over the next two years. 
uh, and thereby never allowing anybody to get over about a 20% load in the mm -hmm. revenue again. So that was a very, very key lesson of um, even if you have a customer who really seems to be that holy grail, there are means in which to slow down the mm -hmm. path and slow their progress from a revenue perspective so that you're not left holding the bag. Mm -hmm. Great lesson. Yeah. Finally, how about one piece of advice that you want to pass on to other entrepreneurs? What can we leave them with? Be kind to yourself. We are a horrible breed, we entrepreneurs. We're hard on ourselves. We take everything personally. Um, we take the weight of our circumstances on completely. Um, too often, and this is not just a female comment, going back to that earlier question, um, we forget about ourselves. And there is still uh, a great case that says continue your education. My grandmother had a great saying that I loved and I live by. You will stop learning the day you take your dirt nap. And essentially never stop educating yourself. Stay on top of things. Look at your people in the eye. Don't just look at your organization. Find out those people who are going to walk through walls with you. Um, but make sure that you understand you can only be a good leader you can only be a good innovator, and you can only be a good person if you think about yourself as well. Don't ignore yourself. Great message. Thanks for taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you.